everybody. <clears throat> this is Dr. Anna, your geology professor, and this is historical geology. Today's topic is the Proterozoic. This uh, picture actually right here shows you the the Archean, you know, the whole Earth history here. Um, and you can see that the Archean is 45.6% uh, of all the geologic time. The Proterozoic is about 42.5 right here. And uh, so when we're talking about the Proterozoic, you got to understand that it's 42.5% it's of all the Earth history. And it's still Precambrian. There is still a lot of um, metamorphic rocks. So we have very hard time doing detailed studies on these rocks. But it's a little bit better than the Archean. Uh, <clears throat> as you as you already know from the Archean, the boundary between the Archean and Proterozoic is really kind of hard to play, so it's very arbitrary. Uh, it's about 2.5 billion years ago uh, because it kind of um, marks the time which um, when the, the evolution, the plate tectonic actually changed ba basically. Uh, but it's still like very approximate because uh, this crustal evolution mostly coming from South Africa, I mean the, the uh, observations coming from South Africa and it happened nearly 3 billion years ago. <clears throat> but in North America these changes um, was between 2.95 to 2.45 billion years ago. So you got to understand that there is a lot of iffy things about this boundary. Now this slide is going to be really important. Uh, I will ask this, the major difference between Archean and Proterozoic. The first major difference is the style of uh, plate tectonics, basically the style of crustal evolution. Uh, we know for a fact that by this time the plate tectonic was normal, like the speed as we know it today, so it wasn't faster. Um, the reason for it is most likely is because by this time the radioactive decay was lesser. Uh, we had less radioactive elements, so therefore the, the decay, um, the result from the radioactive decay was lesser. Uh, so therefore the crust become colder uh, and the mantle uh, convection has slowed down. Uh, so, as we say, the plate tectonic was acting at the rate we know it today. Um, and we know for a fact that there was an existing felsic crust. When I say that, it's granitic. So, it's normal crust like we know it today. And we know for a fact that the continents were large enough because we have quartz sandstone uh, in the Proterozoic, uh, which means that you know, we had large continents and sedimentary rocks could weather away completely and all we have left is quartz sandstone. Uh, and also, it proves that we have had like a continental shelf, shallow marine environment, and of course the river environments. As I said, the, the, the presence of mat mature sedimentary rocks proves that the continents were large enough. And the, the last thing you got to say that we have, we have evidence that the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere increased and um, the ozone layer has been established. So these are the very important um, differences and I will ask you so. Uh, reduced plate tectonics, widespread sedimentary rocks, uh, mature sedimentary rocks and free oxygen in the atmosphere and ozone layer. So these are the very important things you got to know. This slide just shows you the, uh, the distribution of Proterozoic rocks. And now we're going to talk about the, we're going to focus on Laurentia because that's North America. So we have to know a lot about that. Um, Laurentia is pretty large at the time and it consists of mostly North America, Greenland, some of Scotland and per perhaps some of the Baltic Shield of Scandinavia. So it could have belonged to Laurentia at the time. And this map shows you the, 
the different um, continents. And during the Archean, these continents were formed. Of course, you don't have to know them. I wouldn't know it. And they were actually collided together. So that's how North America, Laurentia, become pretty big. So could have produced <clears throat> quartz sandstone, which is the, the mature sedimentary rock, as you know. I'm drinking coffee. It's in the morning. And this was the time when Laurentia actually grew larger on the southern edge uh, by some accretion. When we're talking accretion, it means that smaller continents collide into it, so it becomes bigger by that. And uh, just a reminder, what is Wilson cycle? And you all know it, that's the supercontinent cycle. Remember, it's like three to 350 million years for the for the supercontinent cycle. It starts with initial rifting. This is a very good slide, so you can actually even sketch it if you wish. But if you're not, just say these words right here. So initial rifting, no, yeah, initial rifting, uh, the continents are spreading apart, and then subduction starts, and, um, and then continental collision. So these are the main steps of the supercontinent or Wilson cycle got to remember that and these are the, some of the orogeny you should know one is the wop may and actually there was a lot more but uh if you just know the wop may and trans hudson you're good to go the wop may is the first orogeny which actually um shows every step of the wilson cycle and there is all the details here you know like we have evidence for the rifting the sp spreading, which produced oceanic crust, uh, which got wider and wider. And then, the <clears throat> it was passive margin and it had very characteristic quartz sandstone. Um, it had evidence for well-developed fluvial system remember the the reverse system um so it, it shows every evidence of of a large continent also have uh stromatolytic dolomite and it has also some sub, uh the turbidite which shows the presence of deep water and shale which also forms in the deep water and then we have evidence of the of the um collision and mountain formation. So this is the first one where we have evidence of every step of the supercontinent cycle. And this here shows a cross section of this time. And it shows all the steps, like here is the um, Graben, you know, the passive margin sediments, the subduction with the granitic um, batholiths and, and so on. And this is the other um, big orogeny, the Trans Hudson, and this is very similar to the Wopmai. Uh, it was in the superior region, and that's what separates um, right here. That's what separates the. So we do have evidence for the initial rifting right here, and then it becomes passive margin. Uh, and we have evidence for the passive margin sediment and then the divergence stops and then it reverse uh, direction and uh, we have a bunch of subduction zone volcanic arcs and then we have evidence for uh, collision between the superior and the Wyoming right here now there is a very important thing, and that is the, where am I? Sorry. So this was this one, and now the so-called banded iron formation. The banded iron formation is an extremely important event, so you all should know it. This is the time when actually the, the ozone layer formed, and, there, and we have all the evidence for that. Uh, these rocks which contain the banded iron formation are about 1.8 to 2.5 billion years old. So 
this gives us about 700 million years, which is two super continent cycle, by the way. So it wasn't such a fast process, but, but it was very important. Uh, these banded iron formations uh, include alternating layers of iron-rich material, mostly magnetite and hematite, with silica-rich sediment, which is basically quartz sandstone. Um, each layer is very thin, and they are uh, varying in thickness from millimeter to several centimeters. Now, on Earth, these are the location where you can find the banded iron formation. Basically, this is one of the most important iron ore in the Earth history and on Earth today. But this also present the time when actually the free oxygen reached the level that the ozone layer could uh, form. So this is how the, the banded iron formation looks like. If you look at close-ups, a lot of the times actually the quartz sandstone become uh, tiger eye. So it's absolutely gorgeous. When you polish this sample, it looks really, really, really pretty. Now, why is it so important? It is very important because it, it proves the presence of, of shallow water sediment. And uh, the most important that it actually proves that, that oxygen actually uh, reacted with the iron to make hematite, which is red. So the red, red, red is the first time when we actually have evidence that we have enough oxygen that iron oxide can form. Uh, we believe that the iron actually is coming from deep environments and close to the surface in the shallow water environment, it gets into the quartz sand and reacts with oxygen and making the hematite cement. Sometimes actually it's not only cement, but you have layers of hematite and magnetite. So it's really, really cool. So it proves the presence of shallow water. Uh, it ha we have the mature sedimentary rocks and it proves the presence of enough oxygen so the iron can oxidize. So remember the, the BIF or banded iron formation are extremely important, extremely, extremely important, banded iron formation. Now, we do have evidence that during the early Proterozoic there was a glaciation. And we have talked some about the glaciation. What you really have to see, because of course you don't see U-shaped valleys when it's in the Precambrian. So what you're looking for most of the time is tillite. Remember the tillite is that really unsorted um, sediment, which is like a mixture of coarse, fine, every kind of grain size, definitely angular. Uh, and very many times underneath of the tillite, there is striation on the bedrock. So those are the things you look for to see ice, um, the presence of glaciation. And we do have this in Canada during the early Proterozoic. So we believe that there was a glaciation in the early Proterozoic. The other thing which kind of proves that there was glaciation is the, is the abundant presence of, of red beds. Because just think about it. What happens when uh, we have uh, glaciation? Yeah, we have glaciers on, uh, like right today is Antarctica glaciated. And 2.1% of the water, which normally would be in the water cycle, is actually locked up in this ice. So what kind of climate do we have? Yes, more arid. When the climate is more arid, then you're going to have very widely spreaded red beds, which means the, the quartz sand is going to be um, cemented by hematite or, or iron oxides, other forms of iron oxide. So that also proves that the climate must have been arid, which supports the idea that there was glaciation. So, in the middle of Proterozoic, there was an igneous activity, which is pretty mysterious because we don't really have any kind of evidence that it was related to a major plate tectonic event. Uh, but this was uh, very, very important because almost every shield has it, and uh, mostly granite batholiths and rhyolite lava flows, some gabbro. So, it, it was like all the way from mafic to phasic igneous rocks. And what is really important because they are, um, they have a lot of source rock. We have a lot of gold deposits 
and copper related to this igneous activity. So it's kind of important. This slide actually shows you all the ore deposits related to this igneous activity right here. And now we are at the supercontinent of the middle Proterozoic. The supercontinent actually is the result of the Greenville orogeny, which happened 1.3 to 1 billion years ago. And uh, you can see this uh, activity uh, in Saudi, southeastern Canada and all the way down to Kansas. And uh, these rocks also found in Scandinavia and Greenland. And these rocks also represent the whole Wilson cycle from uh, rifting to collision. And the rifting actually broke up Laurentia. And it was a mid-continent rift which cut through all the Archean and early Proterozoic rocks. And this actually shows you the the whole belt right there, the Greenville orogeny. Right here. I didn't see it clear so but this 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 area, basically the whole area is the Greenville belt. So the supercontinent of the middle Proterozoic is what we call Laurentia. And uh, this most likely includes Greenland, Central Canada, and the North Central U.S. And then we had Gondwana on the south, which included Australia, Antarctica, India, Africa, South America. Interesting that India was part of the southern continent right there. Uh, some people think that th these two actually were together and named it uh, Rodinia, which to me is really, I like Rodinia. So this just shows you Rodinia right here. Um, and now we are at the late Proterozoic. And it's uh, characterized with a very large scale uh, rifting. And it resulted in the breakup of the supercontinent Rodinia. And the plates were drifting apart. And uh, because of that, large part of Gondwana got under uh, the, on the South Pole, and that was a big setup for continental gla glaciation. Every time there is a continent at the pole, it is uh, setting the world up to, to a major glaciation. Um, so this was one of the biggest, biggest uh, glaciation in the Earth history, actually. It was very, very wide, widespread. -ed. And... Uh, just one more time, uh, so you would know what is the glaciation. We have the unsorted, unstratified sediment, sediment the tillite, and then it's associated with the striated underlying pavement or bedrock. And then close to the tillite, we usually have um, finally laminated argillite or, you know, like very clay sediment. And it's what, which means it has layers of, of summer sediment versus layers of winter sediment. We have talked about that before. And it also very many times will contain large clusts which are dropped from the floating ice and we call it dropstone. So that's quite. And then the red beds, of course. You know, I didn't say it right here, but the red beds are part of it too because you know, when the climate becomes more arid, everything becomes red, red beds. And, you know, since the last ice age, this is how Canada uh, that didn't have much sedimentation since the last ice age. So you can imagine this is how everything looked like at the, at the Proterozoic Ice Age or right after it. And this is just a picture of present-day tillite formation around glaciers. And this is a close-up for uh, the tillite right here. See how unsorted um, angular grains, everything. And this is a picture of barbs, but of course it's upside down. So here is where you can see the layers. So you have to imagine this is like 
uh, tilted this way so the layers are horizontal and as you go through them some of it represent uh, summer sediment when the glacier is melted a little bit so a lot of grains are coming in and the winter usually just represent low algae layers because no sediment comes in everything is frozen and this uh, shows a late proterozoic um, glacier sediment very typical you got the unsorted right here the unsorted uh, angular tillite and uh, most likely this was represented by this represents glaciation right there and this one is another one where uh, underneath you can see the striated bedrocks right here here we have we, you can see the different glaciation during the earth history and it's from the beginning so you can see the the very first Paleoproterozoic, late proterozoic, I mean early proterozoic glaciation right here. That one wasn't very long, but here is the late proterozoic. If you look at it right here, it's about 300 million years. I mean, it's really a long time, like more than half of the Phanerozoic, if you think. And um, this was the biggest one in the Earth history. Some people actually believe that this was the so-called snowball Earth which means that the whole earth completely become frozen and the only reason we could come out of it is because of the volcanic activities, you know, like the lava actually melted the snow. Other people think that it, it was almost, earth was almost frozen, but around the equator there was a little bit of area which didn't become frozen. Either way, we know for a fact that we have ice rapid sediment, till light, um, any evidence for ice age present just about everywhere in the world which is really pretty amazing and then we have some ice age in the Ordovician right here and then the Car Carboniferous Permian and as you know we are in an ice age right today so you should know the the ice ages and when did they happen and, and um, just remember the times and about how long they were so it's not such a big deal Okay, I guess I'm going to finish the first segment of the Proterozoic and I will see you in the next segment.